the Basics of Bugs lesson series. Um, thank you, Vincent. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with today's lesson. Get the computer to cooperate. There we go. Okay. Uh, so throughout this week, we've gone over a lot of different topics. We've talked about, you know, what makes uh, an insect an insect versus other things like spiders and centipedes that we might consider bugs but aren't technically an insect. Um, we've also talked about how you can collect insects, uh, what uh, good insects do, what bad insects can do, why it's important to study insects and collect them. Uh, and today, we're going to be going over what to do with all the insects that you might have collected or that you plan to collect in your future. Um, so basically for your equipment, uh, you can go real fancy and get some insect pins. Um, if you don't have those, you can always use something like sewing pins you might find around the house. Um, for a pinning surface, you usually want to look into getting something like styrofoam or a pinning block. Uh, pinning blocks can be sold online through the same places where you would look for the insect pins. Um, or you can make your own at home. Um, and then lastly, you're going to need a place to store your insects after you have them pinned. Um, this could be a box if you want to keep them from getting bumped around too much. Uh, it could be a shadow box if you want to put them on display on your wall. Uh, if you've noticed a few of the videos this week, we had uh, Autumn and Christian. They have a really large uh, framed insect collection that they're slowly building on the wall inside their living room. Uh, if you want to go for something like that, that's also an option that you can look into doing. Um, Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that not all insects are necessarily good for pinning. Uh, in general, the ones that are good are the really big insects like bumblebees, beetles, uh, insects that have a kind of like a hard body, a hard shell. They're going to withstand the test of time once they're put on the pin. Um, there are several insects that are not great for putting on a pin. Uh, these are the insects that usually have a very soft body or they're too small to really fit around the pin once you use it. Um, for example, caterpillars, some of them look really cool and really neat, but they are extremely soft-bodied, and if you put them onto a pen and leave them, uh, they're probably going to rot and fall apart, and it's going to be a real big mess. Uh, so in general, for the soft-bodied or the really small insects, you want to put those into um, alcohol for storage because it'll preserve them. They won't fall apart or rot. Um, and a really cool set of options is to put them in something like hand sanitizer once it becomes more available, of course. Um, the hand sanitizer is neat because you can add some to the container, put your insect or specimen in, add some more, and it'll help them kind of sit in a levitated position and kind of float within your vial, like we have with this beetle over here on the left. Um, another option that's also really cool uh, is to get resin, which you can find a lot of DIY stores like uh, Michael's, um, Hobby Lobby, those kind of places. And you essentially encase your specimen into plastic so you can make paperweights, um, some people do this to make jewelry. Uh, it takes a bit more practice to get it very clear and not full of bubbles, as I've learned from experience, but you can end up with something that's really, really cool. Um, so for the actual pinning process itself, uh, you want to get your insect, you want to put it so that it's facing away from you, like we have in this specimen over here on the left, and you're going to put the pin through the right side of the body. And you see here we have different examples for different groups. Uh, putting it through the right side is the general um, I guess it's the general rule. Uh, it's kind of standardized throughout entomology, and this helps make sure that when you're going through and trying to identify the insect, you know where the pin's going to be. Hopefully it won't be in an area that you need to look at when you're trying to get an ID, because that usually involves looking at very particular structures, and if people were putting the pins all over the place, the pin might get in the way. Um, one thing you may also notice is that for things like butterflies, and this includes dragonflies, uh, when it comes to identifying them, a lot of that depends on the wing structure, not so much the body structure, uh, at least in most cases. Uh, so for those, it's okay to put the pin right through the center of the thorax, which we have an example here. Um, some other things to keep in mind, and this is something that usually takes a lot of practice, is when you're putting the insect on the pin, you want to try to have it level, so it's straight across, and you also want to make sure you have it sitting at the right height. Uh, so if you look at these examples here, we have this really big beetle that's sitting too low on the pin. That's pretty easy to fix. You can simply just bump it up. Uh, the one next to it, this uh, bug right here, is sitting too high on the pin. Because uh, when you go to grab the pin and move the insect around, you're grabbing it from the top. And if the insect is too close, it could get in the way. You could actually bump it and cause it to fall off or break something. So that height is important. 
uh, the one in the middle, just perfect. Uh, the two next to it have the same issue in that they're tilted. One's tilted up, one is tilted down. Um, in this case, you might have to take the insect off the pin and then try putting the pin through again. Um, and this is just something that takes practice. And this is where the pinning block especially comes in handy because you can help control the height and also make sure things are level. Uh, one thing to also consider, especially if you want to go into the sciences and entomology, is you need to include a label. And this has been mentioned a, a few times before uh, throughout this week. The labels are super important for people that are studying insects because we need to know where it was collected, you know, when it was collected, who collected it. Uh, if you can add information on the ecology, for instance, if you find an insect that's on a plant, you include information about that plant. Um, and then also if you have that information, you can put down the label. So if you're able to identify it to um, order family to the specific species, those are all really helpful. And these are things that we pretty much require to be on the pen, because if you bring, uh, say you're going through a collection at the museum and you find a really neat insect, but there's no labeling on it, then you're kind of lost because you don't know where the person collected it, you know, what time of year they collected it. If you want to study this insect some more, you're uh, kind of stuck as far as getting more information on it because they didn't include it when they put it into the museum. Uh, so right here, I'm going to start a video. Um, it's about seven minutes long. Hopefully it's not too choppy. If it is, then when we upload this to YouTube later on, it should be very smooth. Um, so bear with me just a second while I bring that up. Hopefully everybody, I hope I'm going at a, a good pace. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask the moderators. They should be able to help you with that. Hi, Chelsea. Um, we didn't, we're not seeing the video. You're not seeing the video? No. That's not good. I'm very sorry about that. We're already a minute and a half in. Okay. Let me see if I can fix this real quick. Sorry, everybody. Okay, can you see the video now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, sorry that we're already minute in. Please bear with me. I'll dial back just a little bit. Um, we can try this again. Can you hear it okay? No, I don't think you shared your computer audio. So sorry. Oh man. I'm sorry, everybody. If we can't get it to work, then we'll skip it for now and then it'll be on YouTube. But I will try one more thing. Um, try to find the share computer audio. 
And I thought I had this down pat, but apparently not. There it is, okay. Uh, just to catch you up, I talked about the block, talked about the different pin types, and then in just a moment, we'll actually start pinning insects. Apologies about the, the whole uh, So you have sewing kit, here now. whereas these smaller ones here are pins that are specifically designed for pinning insects. Um, there's a pretty good range of what you're available to use. Uh, if you can't get the professional pins, it's no big deal. You can get sewing pins. Uh, which you can, should be able to find just about any kind of supermarket. Uh, you've got a lot of flexibility to work with here. So to start with pinning, let's start with the big guy here. So when it comes to pinning an insect, you want to make sure that you pin it on the right side of the body. So we can bring it here. So here we have our B. And when it comes to looking at the right side of the body, you want to start at the head, move down to the abdomen, and you want to pin it right here on the top of the thorax. You want to put it towards the right side. Uh, putting the pin through the right side is just the general rule when it comes to pinning insects. And by keeping that standard, it makes it easier for other people who come in later to see what's been pinned and to work their way through identifying the insect. Uh, so to start, we're going to put our guy up here. We're going to try to line him up on the hole there. Zoom a bit here. Okay. We're going to pick out our pin here. I'll actually go ahead and use the sewing pin right here. Let me see if I can get him. So you want to hold him secure on the surface. Uh, these were actually frozen, so they're still flexible even though they are very old. Uh, these were all collected in uh, various traps and nets. You want to put it through this area right here. Push it down. So now we have it in our insect. We want to try to line it up with the hole here. Sometimes it can be a little hard to find. Might need a little bit of a peek. I'm having a hard time finding the opening here. Here we go. Okay. So now it is done. And if you notice, it's even on the pin throughout. Because you want to try to get that pin to be straight up and down. You want the insect to be flat up and down. Right. And then once you have it pinned, you will be placing your insect preferably onto a piece of styrofoam, like what we have here. So now it is good to go. Uh, if you want to add in uh, labels to your insect. It's very simple. Here we have the location label, or sorry, the ID label, and here we have the label with the information on where it was collected, when, and who also collected it which is very important. So this one's going to go on first, which means we're going to put it right here. We're going to line up with the hole, put our little buddy there. So we got that one in there. Now we'll do the same for this one. We'll line it up here with the hole. Come in with your pin. Like this does take practice. Sometimes it can be hard to find the right opening. There we go. Now we'll put it this way. Now we are dealing with a very big insect, so it doesn't leave us a whole lot of space. Normally you want to put a fair amount up here at the top of the pin, but sometimes if you are working with a really big uh, bug, you might have to kind of work around that because this doesn't give us a lot of space for putting it into start foam. But sometimes you got to work with what you have. Real quick, I'm going to do this one right here. Here we have a beetle. Same principle applies. Uh, you may notice that we have this big structure right here. Uh, you might think, oh, okay, it's the segment after the head. That's where I put the pin. Actually, you want to put it down here on top of the elytra, which is the term we use to mean the, uh, the outer covering the wings. We'll put this guy 
on our pinning block, we'll pick out our pin. This guy, his legs make him a little bit trickier to work with, but we can just get him to stay put. Here we go. Again, right side relative to the insect, we have the head up here, the back end down here, the end of the abdomen. We want to pin it through this right elytra. We'll push the pin through. We want to try to line it up above the hole. And there we go. Good to go. He's very flat on the pin. It's not lopsided. He is ready to go onto the styrofoam. Okay. We got one more insect that I'll demonstrate here. This one is a winged ant. So ant, ants will get their wings when it's mating time to help them go find a mate and then after they've mated to help them go find a location to start a new colony. So we see this one has got wings here. And we want to preserve the wings because they are fragile and they are important for uh, identifying a lot of uh, insects, especially hymenopterans, which ants are included in, along with the bees and wasps. This one is a lot smaller, so it does get trickier. It's okay if it's a little hard. It, it, it can be difficult for even people that are really experienced with insect pinning. Uh, but we want to try to get it through the head. Again, you know, no worries if it's hard. Sometimes it is hard. Some are easier than others to work with. This one is difficult. Okay. I think it's also important that you try to avoid accidentally hurting yourself with the pin. Okay. We got the first part in. Let's try to get him. Here we go. Okay. It has been pinned. You can see. Okay. Hopefully the video played uh, pretty smoothly there. Um, let's see. We got a little bit left on the slideshow, and then after that we'll move on to the um, Kahoot quiz, which I hope you guys will also enjoy. All right. So next up is learning how to do some basic insect ID to order. Uh, when we talk about an insect order, this is kind of like a scientific grouping of insects that are related to each other. Uh, for example, you might know of cockroaches by their common name, which is just cockroach. But there are a lot of different species of cockroach. We have this example here, this picture of what's known as an American cockroach. There's the German cockroach. There are wood roaches. Um, there's all kinds. And they're all put in the same order, which is Blatodia, which the order names are usually based on Latin or Greek. Um, and they usually have a very specific ending here, which is that EA, which helps us look at uh, EA or uh, ODA. There's usually an ending that lets us know that, oh, we're looking at an order name as opposed to, say, a common name or a species name. Um, when it comes to identifying cockroaches, you look for those really long, thin antennae. They have a generally oval-shaped body. Uh, their legs are usually really spiny. Um, and they also have a pair of circe on the end of the abdomen, which are kind of like a short, stumpy uh, antenna almost is what they look like. And you'll see this in another group too in a little bit. Let me go to the next one. Sorry, I'm having some technical problems. I don't know why the screen won't move forward. This is very odd. Okay. You can just do it this way. It won't uh, cooperate. Can you guys hear me okay? I am so sorry that there is technical issues. Let me try to get this to work again. Okay, there we go. All right, uh, so after the cockroaches, we have the dragonflies. I'm sure you guys are really familiar with these because you've probably seen them zipping and flying around real fast. Um, they're considered in the order Odinata, 
You can tell them apart from some of the other insects because they have those really big, large compound eyes that helps them look for prey. Uh, they have mouths made for chewing. And what's also notable is that they have four really large wings and they hold them out flat like an airplane's wings. Uh, whereas a lot of other insects will fold the wings close to the body. Uh, like if you think about a butterfly where they fold them close like this. Um, and then also the body tends to be very long and slender. Uh, the next group, grasshoppers and crickets, something I'm sure you guys have also seen quite a few of. Uh, they're in the order of Orthoptera. Um, one way to tell the difference between the two here, grasshoppers tend to have shorter antennae. Um, they, uh, as opposed to the really long, thin antennae you see in crickets, uh, they both have those really strong jumping legs that helps them get away from predators. Uh, and one thing that's also notable is if you look on the cricket here, uh, just like the cockroaches, it also has a pair of Circe. In this case, they look like really long uh, antennae off the back of the abdomen. Uh, also, mantids, which I hope a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, these are super cool insects. Uh, they're, you can notice them by their triangular head. They have a long, relatively thin thorax. And then what's super, like a dead giveaway for this group, are those uh, forelegs there, the raptorial forelegs, which were mentioned in the first lesson this week, that they used to quickly grab prey, grab prey and bring it to the mouth to eat. Um, if you see a stick insect, sometimes stick insects and mantids can look a little similar because they both have very thin bodies. They tend to be kind of brown or green to blend in with foliage. But stick insects won't have those uh, raptorial forelegs. It's something that you pretty much only see uh, in the mantids here when you're out collecting. Uh, next are the true bugs. Um, they're in the order Hemiptera. And the name Hemiptera comes from the fact that their wings are special and that half the wing is kind of leathery and thick and the other half of the set of wings is very thin and membranous. Um, they also have a tube-like mouth part they use to kind of like a straw to puncture a plant and then suck out the juices. Um, and this group is super diverse. There are so many different kinds of hemipteran. And you can see some examples here on the left side of the uh, screen. And you can see where one of them kind of looks like a stick insect too. Some of them look a bit like beetles because they're kind of uh, large and uh, rounded. Um, and the one down here at the bottom, right of the screen is called a brown marmorated stink bug. And this is one of the reasons why collecting and having labeling is super important because this is an invasive species that was recently, semi-recently introduced in the United States and is slowly spreading uh, towards the West and throughout the South. Um, and there are a lot of other insects that look just like it. So if you're trying to figure out if this place is spread to where you live, you need to collect a specimen and take it to somebody that can identify it. And if they have the actual specimen there with the information where it was collected, you know, what time of year, they can learn a lot about it and they can help figure out if this is recently spread to a new location. Um, and it's really important with these guys because they damage our crops. Uh, during this past winter, if you had a brown stink bug in your house, chances are it was probably one of these because they like to come inside when it's cold. Um, and it's super important that we keep track of these. Uh, next up, a group that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, even if you don't really like insects, uh, are butterflies and moths. Um, a dead giveaway are those really beautiful wings that they have, which are covered in a powdery scale-like substance. If you've ever touched a moth or a butterfly, you may have noticed that you had the powder left on your hands afterwards. That's a dead giveaway. Um, also, the antennae tend to be long and thin with a club at the end. And moths and butterflies usually have a very long, thin mouth that they curl up in a tube when they're not using it. And then when they are using it, they'll kind of like straighten it out like a straw so they can get to the nectar at the bottom of flowers. Um, and I'm sure you're also familiar with the larval form of moths and butterflies, which are caterpillars. And we have various examples down here. Uh, next up are the beetles. This is another super big diverse group, just like the true bugs we mentioned earlier. Uh, you can look at all the different colors and shapes we have in this example down here on the left. Uh, they have chewing mouth parts and they have a really hard outer shell, which is made up of their first pair of wings called the elytra. And that's a, one way to tell the difference between them and some of the other groups is that hard elytra and the chewing mouth parts. Because if you remember the hemipterans, uh, they have a straw for feet and they don't have chewing mouth parts. So that's a, one way to tell the difference there. Uh, we also have this big group here, wasps, bees, and ants. They're all in the order Hymenoptera. Um, basically, ants are just 
you know, wasps and bees that don't get wings most of the time. Uh, as I mentioned before in the pinning video, when it's uh, time to mate, uh, you'll often see them develop wings to help them fly and find a mate. Um, but in general, this group tends to have short, stout antennae. Uh, the wasp have that wasp waist, which is that really thin connection between the most of the thorax and the abdomen there. Uh, they usually have four wings that are very clear. Some of them have a bit of spotting on them, but usually clear. And they also tend to be pretty fuzzy, uh, especially bees and other uh, hominopterans that are heavily involved in pollination because that hair is what picks up the pollen that they transport between plant and plant or flower to flower. Uh, lastly, we have the dipterans, which are the flies. Uh, this includes like a house fly, mosquitoes. Uh, over here on the left, we have uh, half of what is called a crane fly, which looks like a really big mosquito, and some people call them mosquito hawks. Um, but these are completely harmless to people, even though they look kind of scary like a, a giant monster-sized mosquito. Um, but in general, this group tends to have shorter stout antennae. Uh, if you notice, some mosquitoes and uh, midges have uh, antennae that look almost like a feather duster because it's covered in all these different hairs. Uh, they usually have two pairs of wings that are they're usually clear. Some of them have patterns. Um, and then the second pair of wings has been uh, converted into a separate set of structures called halteres, which you can see over here on the uh, crane fly. It looks like a little stick with a ball at the end. And that helps them maintain balance while they're flying. And if you've ever tried to swat a fly um, or shoo a fly out of a place, you notice they're really acrobatic. It's kind of hard to hit them because they fly all over the place. They do really tricky maneuvers and the halteers help them do that. It makes them really good flyers. Uh, the last thing we'll do before we end today is just a Kahoot quiz where we'll go over some of these insect orders and test your knowledge on their identification. I've got the code right here um, that should be available in the chat too. I'll go to the screen and help us get ready. Can you guys see the Kahoot screen? Uh, oh, it's good for number now too. Okay, let's use this number here. Hey, uh, Louis, can you see the Kahoot screen? Yes, yeah, I'm going to make it a little Yeah, I'm going to make it a little First up, what is the common name for these insects? Yeah, it's called Sarah, but I got that right. You can see some of them look really pretty, just like butterflies and the patterns that they have on the wings. Really close competition too. Yeah, do you guys remember what kind of legs praying mantises have? Yeah, raptorial. Uh, the saltorial legs I see one person got. Those are the jumping legs that you see on crickets and grasshoppers. I remember that the, the beetles 
um, they don't have that like half leathery, half membranous wing. That outer covering wing is very hard. That's the elytra. Yeah, so you can remember the. We only have one or two questions left, but it's still pretty close between the top spots there. Here you go. Uh, what order do spiders belong to? Yeah, spiders are not insects. Uh, and I see the one person hit arachnid, and the, the key here was insect order. Sorry if that might have been a little confusing. Shaped mouth. I see a couple people chose the short stubby antennae. Remember, you don't see that in butterflies, you see that more in the uh, flies, like house flies and mosquitoes. I think this is, yeah, here we go, last question. <laughs> Ants look pretty different compared to wasp and bees, but ants are essentially wasp and bees without wings. Um, right, we did good. Let's see. Rockstar crab took the wind from uh, the jaguar. Okay, so we've pretty much reached the end of today's lesson, which is the last one. I'm going to leave you on this last page, which has some more insects that we didn't necessarily talk about, but I think are super cool.